Greetings, Guardians. My name is Byfear. So, it's another day, and it's another early day at that in the lifespan of Witch Queen, which means that we have another spoiler warning for you. Come next Tuesday, I'm going to stop doing these with regular content, seeing as, well, I think everyone by that point will have had a chance to play. However, there are still going to be some things you should note. By next Tuesday, the thumbnails that I've made on certain videos, including this one, will stop being innocuous and will contain spoilers. So, yeah, you've been warned on that one. Also, there are a few exceptions that will remain in place. Of course, that includes the uh, ending of the seasonal story and the raid. So keep that in mind. The spoilers will still be off the table for those key points, and I will go ahead and change the thumbnail on the raid video after about it couple of days until we get the weekly reset. Point being, you know, if you're looking at all of this stuff, be prepared for the spoiler warnings to stop after about a week, because by that point in time I'm going to presume that everyone has had a chance to watch this stuff. Anyway, that's your spoiler warning. Turn off now. So, let's get into the video. Today I wanted to go ahead and start by talking about Dynasty. Yes, same spiel as before, thanks for the assistance on getting it viewed again, and I really appreciate all of that. I actually wanted to focus on something in Dynasty for different reasons. Predominantly because there's a line within Dynasty that I wanted to highlight which I feel aged particularly well. All the others out there who've also studied, they know just as well as I, the stories we've heard, they could all be lies. That's the problem with fighting a god of deception. Ah, and there it is. God of deception. I know, self-aggrandizing, but seriously, there's a reason that I wrote this into the dialogue. A very good reason at that. Why? Because the Books of Sorrow, in various different points, implies very much that the book is full of lies and that some of the things you read in there may be subject to different interpretations. Turns out that there was, of course, an even bigger revelation within Witch Queen that comes from the penultimate cutscene in the campaign, which plays before the final mission. For those of you that are a bit lost, well, uh, let's go ahead and explain what happened. The relic that we discover at the beginning of the campaign on Mars is essentially a powerful artifact of darkness. It contains a power of darkness that allows you to link things together through time and memory. This means that certain objects that have strong psychic imprints can be investigated with this powerful dark relic using the power that it provided, the power of deep sight. Deep Sight essentially allows you to look into those psychic imprints and to unravel them and effectively lets you create them and recreate them from previous timelines in this current one. It's a power that is obtained through the darkness, but it's very much linked to memory. Earlier in the campaign, we were able to steal something from the temple known as the Temple of the Cunning within Savathun's throne world, a shrine that Savathun dedicated to her past self known as Sathona. The object we stole was the calcified remains of the Worm Familiar that she had taken all the way with her from Fundament. This Worm Familiar had a pretty significant part to play in the entire story of the Hive. It originally washed up from the deep oceans of Fundament onto the shores of the Osmium Court. This was the region that was ruled by the father of Savathun and Oryx and Shivo Rath, a figure that's identified only as the Old Osmium King. He kept the familiar in a jar, and it clearly whispered to him, as these worms tend to do even after death. They still are able to whisper just in the same way as Ahamkara are, which is very mysterious. It told the Old King of a coming apocalypse, the God Wave, that would supposedly be caused by the alignment of all of Fundament's 52 moons. This knowledge haunted the king, who would pass it on to his eldest daughter, Orash. Later, Sathona, the middle child of the three, would acquire the worm as the three were fleeing the Osmium Court from the Helium Drinkers, another group of Krill, the proto-hive species, who had come to kill the old Osmium King. It seems even more now that the worm clearly whispered to Sathona as well. And when it whispered to her, it clearly told her the same series of things that it had told the king. But what's even more fascinating is that as this worm whispered to the one who would one day become the Queen of Lies, it itself was lying all along. Take a listen to this cutscene. The memory that was extracted from the worm when we used deep sight resonance on it 
to draw the psychic imprint of an important moment from it, a moment that inevitably changed the history of destiny. These frail siblings will soon be claimed by the light. Unless we claim them first, we will tell the most cunning sibling of a cataclysm, a prophecy of great loss. We will feed her fear, her pride. We will say, young Sathona, the end is coming. I don't think I can overstate how important this moment is. Of course, it's important in terms of the story of the Hive and their very nature. That is not something that can be debated. It fundamentally changes the nature of their story, and the ramifications of that moment are unquantifiable, not just for the Hive, but also for all the millions that they interacted with. Those who sit and know the Hive's history know that they have butchered thousands of races, over millions and millions of years. This is a species that has been driven by the requirement for an endless blood tithe. This is a species that, thanks to the ingestion of the worms, the larvae of the worm gods, has been bound permanently to the power of the darkness up until the point where their worms are excised. This is a moment where we are able to sit and adequately say that destiny's history changed. This is something that has even affected us. We who have suffered and fought against the Hive, we who now see them stealing our light. This is an important moment for that very reason. But there are further ramifications for all of this. For one, it implies that the Worms and the Worm Gods are directly connected to the Witness and therefore the Darkness, and the voice speaking through the Worm is clearly that of the Witness. Now to clarify, the worm itself is not the witness, the worm is not speaking as the witness. The worm is having a psychic memory, a memory that it is recalling of the witness's voice. It means that the worm was there to hear of the witness's plan. What can be seen from this memory is very clearly that the darkness manipulated the hive and prevented them from being chosen by the traveler by instead choosing them to become a subservient race of darkness-aligned puppets. Before I go on and talk about a few other lies that were clear in the Books of Sorrow, I wanted to go ahead and talk about what this means for the potential future and story of the Hive and Destiny. The Hive, as an entire civilization, with their worms and their allegiance to darkness being lied to from the beginning, could fundamentally change the nature of the war we're about to face. For the first time ever, it seems clear that if there was enough of a will to do so, the Hive could turn away from the darkness for their own reasons, other than simply Savathun's need to claim the light. Savathun is the first clear example of one who defied the power of the darkness, but this lie that runs so deeply as to affect every single one of the Hive would inevitably have an effect on every one of them. In particular, and of greatest importance, I think, it makes me wonder what's going to happen with Shivu Arath. If Shivu were to be told about the nature of the Hive's relationship with the Darkness, then there's a fleeting chance that her loyalties could be tested. She is the current leader of the Darkness-aligned Hive Swarms, and if she was told the truth and believed it, it's possible that she could be convinced to turn against her former masters. My personal story prediction for all of this and a narrative reason for why Imaru, Savathun's ghost, is alive and was evacuated essentially at the end of the campaign for Witch Queen, is, I think, in order for him to resurrect Savathun. 
as this kind of news that Shivor Roth would need to hear, the news that the Worm Gods had lied to them from the beginning and the darkness was in fact manipulating them, would be something that maybe could only truly be confirmed by Savathun. It's something that maybe Shuvor Roth could only hear from a family member. Imagine us as Guardians coming along and trying to tell her that. She wouldn't believe it. But Savathun, without her worm, attached to the light, but also coming in supplication, only with truth, that might be a moment at which we could sit and we could say adequately that maybe Suvu might be convinced. But all of that's getting ahead of the story, and honestly, for all we know, this might make no impact on Shivu or Wrath. She's a being of strength and war, and perhaps this makes no difference to her and her brood given the war that she seeks would still persist in the universe. We don't know enough about the true character of Shivu or Wrath to know definitively whether or not she would turn, but it's something I want you all to keep in mind. We may revisit the topic for a later video when it becomes relevant again. But for the moment, it is a fascinating detail to know. Now with all of that said, how does this fundamentally change the Books of Sorrow? Well, the answer is not much at all, really. Except for the obvious lie at the very beginning. You see, this is an extra piece of perspective. It's something that adds onto it, but it doesn't invalidate the vast majority of what happened, supposedly, in the Books of Sorrow. You see, whilst it certainly is true, that the God Wave of Fundament was a lie, and that the Darkness was indeed simply trying to claim the siblings of the Osmium Dynasty before the Traveler could come and bless them with their light, it is also the case that we can still look at the larger events of the Books of Sorrow and state that, yeah, all of this is mostly unchanged. There are some fundamental lies in the Books of Sorrow, namely at the very beginning, and there are still moments in which we can sit and question things, but ultimately, I think it's worth just simply remembering that the biggest lie is now laid bare for all of us to see. There are certainly some more clarifications. It appears that the Worm Familiar more closely leaned on Savathun, and it appears that her coaxing her sisters into the deep at the time being would have been a moment when she was simply allowing confirmation bias to truly rule the situation. The siblings didn't exactly work democratically, but Shivu, or Shiro as she was known at the time, was going to follow the lead of Orash and Sathona, and Orash led the three knowing the words of her father, knowing that the God Wave was coming. This was a moment at which maybe the Worms were effectively acting to inform confirmation bias, because if this was something that Orash had said, then perhaps Sathona's pride would have felt justified in the moment when the worm told her again of the coming cataclysm and the coming collapse that would occur on Fundament. This is not so much a moment of retroactive continuity for this particular moment of who was told to go down into the deep by the worm. They both were, and that was always very clear from the beginning, but it seems like the story is now emphasizing the fact that Sathona was leaned on much more heavily than Orash was. And there are a few other details that are worth pointing out more generally in the Books of Sorrow, and something that I wanted to go ahead and bring up with all of you, because there is a rather famous line which pointed us all in this direction in the first place, even if it probably didn't indicate this. I wanted to go ahead and highlight this one section of the Books of Sorrow. It's not famous, I don't think, but it's very well referenced within lore circles because it's the first instance at which we see Savathun deliberately typing in the margins of something, graffitiing and leaving her mark, basically stating, hey, I've been here and I've written in this book too. Not all of it is completely correct, is what the implication that was left for us was. And maybe we will get a little more clarification on this, but for the time being, I'm going to go ahead and just read this in full. This is from the text in the Books of Sorrow where we see the Dreadnought being created. It's certainly far into the Books of Sorrow, I believe it's in their fourth verse, but all of this does not require much context other than the fact that the Dreadnought was a massive hive ship that Oryx specifically constructed to build his throne world. We went there in the Destiny 1 Taken King expansion. To make his ship, Oryx scrimshored one piece of Akka, who was dead but far from gone. 
He stole the hammer of Suvor Wrath and the scalpel of Savathun, and he armoured his ship in baneful armour. When Oryx had built his Dreadnought, he pushed his throne world inside out so that it bled into the material space of the Dreadnought. They were coterminous and allied his ship and his sin. The Dreadnought was within the throne world, and the throne world of Oryx was the Dreadnought. Ayat. This required a verse from the Tablets of Ruin. The whole court worked together to push Oryx's throne inside out. This was a day of joyous violence, and all of Oryx's broods mark this holiday as Eversion Day, which is celebrated by turning things inside out. Saith Oryx, go out into the universe, my court. Gather tribute for me. Send it home to my ship. When I call you, walk up that tribute to my court. I will prepare for long voyages. Into the war. Into the deep. I am Savathun, Insidious. I graffiti this notice for you. These books are full of lies. Now Oryx's throne was safe from incursion, because it moved so nimbly. So there's a few things to notice here, but the big thing to notice, which we're really going to wrap in on, is simply Savathun's general graffitied notice within the books of Sorrow that they are full of lies. This points to what I believe is the biggest note of the entire story, which is that Oryx is the one narrating it, and therefore it's written to tell his particular version of events. In one of the cutscenes for Witch Queen, Zavala says that the Books of Sorrow are essentially sort of like hive propaganda. Now, whilst in broad strokes, I think Zavala is wrong here, given that many of the events within the Books of Sorrow actually happened, I do think that he's correct in a sense, and that this is very much a version of events that best exemplified Oryx above his siblings, a version that is supposed to be complementary to him. And in that respect, it is propaganda. It twists events into a new truth that better suits the one writing it. Most crucially, there are those last few lines that need to be read to be understood. I will prepare for long voyages into the war, into the deep might be a complete statement, or Savathun might have graffitied over and removed offending sentences to her in particular, something that maybe changes the context of what we read there. This could read completely differently. That's just some food for thought, but I think ultimately the bigger point here is that Savathun might be making commentary as a result on the whole of the story of the Hive in general that is told within the Books of Sorrow. It may be this note that the author is embellishing. It may be this point that this is clearly designed to dignify Oryx above others. There have always been hints that the Books of Sorrow are not a perfect series of narrated histories. No history is, of course, especially ones where there are opinions and powerful individuals who can have an impact on the way that history is told. And therefore, the history of the Hive as we know it is incomplete and imperfect. By the very nature of history itself, almost every moment will be like this. If there's perhaps anything we can learn from this story, I think it's simply this. Treat everything you read with the knowledge that the edges are burnt, and that with that, the true picture of what you're trying to understand is never quite truly filled in. Sometimes those burnt edges obscure nothing, and it's just the odd texture around which you need to read. But sometimes, when those edges are burned, they were burned because someone was trying to stop you reading them, and they may have had words on them. Just some food for thought. Anyway, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed, and hopefully this is something that was of interest to you. If it was, go ahead and let me know down below in the comments section. Of course, if you enjoyed this, also go ahead and leave a like. And of course, you can hit the subscribe button and hit the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Parodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.